mortal beings kept in a state of immortality by the tree of life, separation from that tree returned them to their original mortal condition. And going back to this improvement era statement in 1910, whether the mortal bodies of man were born here in mortality is not fully revealed by the word of God. Now, if we interpret the scriptures, when we look at this Genesis story, and we read not into it what's not there, but if we only read what's there, that story is not inconsistent with two mortal beings, Adam and Eve, being plucked out of the mainstream, whatever that looked like at that time, and isolated in a garden where they had access to a tree that kept them immortal. Once they partook, partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which was part of the plan, it was placed there uh, specifically for them to do that as an, an inevitable action, then they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. Now, the only single place in all of recorded scriptural history where God placed an armed guard on something, including the Ark of the Covenant, was the Tree of Life. That's the only place that we've ever, we've ever been told that there was an armed guard to keep them from coming there. Why? Well, ask yourselves that. Being mortal yourselves, if you had access to the Tree of Life, what would you try to do to take, partake of the fruit? Sneak around a cherubim with a flaming sword, maybe. <laughs> Next slide. Now, lastly, I'd just like to talk for a minute, minute about one other issue here. What I've tried to do is talk about the, the data that science presents to us in terms of the DNA data, the fossil record data, uh, which, which, incidentally, one of the reasons that we, uh, uh, I have just a, a little bit of extra time here, I'm running a little bit fat, I'll talk speaker quite fast. Um, I tell my students, in fact, that if I'm, uh, if I'm running uh, short on time, I can get my half of my lecture in the last five minutes. <laughs> but um, one of the reasons we started on this project uh, is that we had a student, I had a student come to me uh, a number of years ago by the name of Forrest Peterson, who was a, a non-traditional student at ISU. He was a theater major um, and was taking a biology class as a required course. And in that class, uh, evolution was being taught as, as we do in any biology class. But at the same time, the instructor, who was a graduate student, was putting down the idea of, of religion as being demonstrated to be completely fallacious because of what we knew about evolution, etc. So the student went to the uh, department chairman and complained about the way the course was being taught, and the department chairman sent him to me uh, so that we could and, and we sat down and talked about his issue. He's LDS and wanted to uh, wanted to know my opinion. So we sat down and talked for a while. And after we finished talking, and I told him basically what I've been telling you to, to, to a certain degree. He said, well, is there a book I can read about this? And I said, no, there really isn't. Because most of the books that have been written on this subject, or almost all the books that have been written on the subject, were written before 1970, approximately, 1972. Now, the molecular revolution can almost be dated to approximately 1972, when the first DNA sequence, uh, sequencing was done. So before 1972, we really can't say a lot about the DNA evidence. We can say, uh, and papers were written back in the late 60s about cytochrome C, amino acid sequences, and et cetera. Uh, and and that, those were very fine data, but nothing in terms of the power of what we now know from, from DNA data. So over the last 30 years, we have learned more than we ever learned, knew in the past about our relatedness to other animals. Secondly, the entire hominid fossil record, it's been said, could fit in a shoebox. Now, before 1970, that may have been approximately true. Today, we would have a difficult time holding all the specimens in this room and displaying them adequately. There's a huge explosion in both of these two witnesses. 
both the, the DNA evidence and the molecular the molecular evidence and the fossil record evidence uh, in the last 30 years. So that's what I wanted. That's what I've been talking about. Now, the other issue that I want to talk about is this question: If we are created in the image of God, then how does that happen through an evolutionary process? If that process is number one random, and number two has no direction to it, as we teach in biology. How can those two things not be incompatible? How is it that we can have physical bodies which look like gods and therefore have some design if they weren't designed? The answer, in my opinion, and this is where the, uh, a large portion of my research uh, in the field of biological uh, research is centered, and that is the concept of developmental constraint. We have both developmental constraints and evolutionary constraints. And I'm not talking here about intelligent design, which is a, uh, an issue that's been now uh, um, created by the creationists to try to fill in some of the missing gaps that have been uh, blocked up by, uh, by other data. Um, let me just leave it here for right now. What this concept, and I didn't uh, add any uh, more slides to talk about this because I didn't think of the, uh, that would be a better one. Uh, what this concept is dealing with is the issue that, uh, let me start with the simplest biological form that exists. Anybody have any idea what that might be? A what? Virus. Viruses are very complex in shape. Simple, very simple. Simplest object in the universe is? A sphere. The, that's where you and I all began. We all began as a single-celled sphere. And oocyte, once it was fertilized, it then became a zygote, and that zygote is still spherical. Now, the question then can be raised, and it really was raised a long time ago by a, uh, by a brilliant biologist by the name of Darcy Thompson, and what I've been trying to do is apply what Darcy Thompson applied to adult organisms to the developing embryo. Now, if a sphere is the simplest object in the universe, and I can take a bottle of soap and I can blow soap bubbles, and they're all spherical until I land on a flat surface, then how many genes does it take to make an oocyte or a zygote spherical? That seems to be a waste of genes, right? Why would you have to use any genes to make something spherical if it's already in spherical inherently? And so that raises some very intriguing questions, particularly when we now recognize that we only have about 30,000 genes to make us, rather than 150,000 genes that we had a mere 10 years ago. We've lost a considerable degree of sophistication in the last 10 years. If we only have those 30,000 genes to make us, then maybe a lot of what we are is not genetic in the first place, but rather inherent qualities of the physics of the stuff from which we are formed. Now, if that's the case, then there's a lot of predictability out there. There's a lot of predictability inherent in biology, which I would argue for the last 150 years that biologists have not looked for because we have expected, our, based on our paradigm of randomness, we have expected to find disorder. We have not looked for order in biological systems, with a few exceptions, like Darcy Thompson, for example. As we look, and I have been looking in, in embryonic development for these, uh, for these uh, developmental constraints, we can find them. They're there, they're numerous. In fact, I, in my opinion, they are so numerous that they constrain us to the form that we now see. Next slide. So in final conclusion, the data support the scientific interpretation of an evolutionary process for human origins. The scriptures that state that God created humans in his image we believe these two apparently contradictory paradigms can be reconciled with God created 
the natural laws by which humans were created. We refer to these, to those natural laws as evolution in, in a package. Conflicts between the scientific data and the religious uh, uh, the scriptural accounts result from our interpretation of the scriptures and our, our interpretation of the scientific data. They're not in the data or in the scriptures inherently. Thank you.